Good evening. Good evening. All right. It is a uh, blessed with opportunity to stand before you all here this evening. I'd like to thank the elders for this evening that I could have a few minutes of your time here this evening and speak about something that's been on my mind for the past few months. Uh, Kaysen, thank you for the scripture reading. Good job. Um, this story that uh, he just read is a story from Jesus' childhood. And like I said, uh, his, his answer that he gives his parents here is um, something that's been on my mind for the last few months. He said he, he must be about his, his father's business. And um, which, which bring me down the rabbit hole of this. Um, a few months back, Brother uh, Tommy Peeler brought us a series of lessons called From Sin to Salvation. One of those was called The Greatest Story Ever Told. That meeting, uh, that meeting I went to uh, Matthew's account of the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, I, and uh, I read, and my mind began to think back about how Jesus' mind must have been like, what he must have been thinking of during that time. He knew what was fixing to happen. He knew that he would be betrayed. He knew that the hour was almost at hand. Uh, he, knew his, he knew his father's plan. I, pl- I, I, uh, I want to bring this up tonight uh, about, think about Jesus' mindset in his final hours here on earth. The story that is referred to as the greatest story that's ever told. Jesus, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the one who died on the cross for our sins to make a way that we can follow the new law that we are under. We think of the crucifixion of Christ. Do we ever think of the events leading up to the main event, events leading up to the crucifixion, so to speak? Before, um, before he was before Pilate, before the cross, before the beating, the scourging, utter and physical humiliation, um, Christ, he was like you and he was like me. He felt, he heard, he touched, and he had the same temptations as we have in our life today. As I was trying to piece all this together in my mind, this thought came to mind. Jesus' mindset. What was his mindset through all of this, through his whole life, through what he went through in these next coming up few hours, few days? What was his mindset? Before I take you all on this journey with me, I want to bring you all something. Us as morals will never be able to try and wrap our heads around Jesus' mindset. And uh, one, but one thing is blatantly obvious. Um, we will never uh, be able to understand the true mindset of Christ. But I hope that after tonight... After this lesson, we will have a better understanding of this, of his thought process, so to speak. That's behind his mindset and behind how he, uh, how he, how he thought. I have uh, three points here this evening. Um, the first one is the thought behind the mindset. Uh, the second point that I have this evening is Jesus' mindset in the garden. And the third point I have this meeting this evening is uh, Jesus' mindset on the cross. The, the thought behind his mindset. With this in mind, I want to take you back to the night that, that he was betrayed, to the night that he was betrayed, right before the institution of the Lord's Supper, following Matthew 26. He was surrounded by his disciples, his followers that had been with him throughout his ministry around three years of his life, and had been, and some had been following him since the beginning. Most important years of his life, they were gathered together in one place, gathered around Christ. They had done what he had asked them to do. They had prepared the Passover, which was to be the last supper. Matthew twenty-six. Verses 20 through 25. Verse 20, it says, 
Now when the evening came, Jesus was reciting at the table with his twelve disciples. As they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of, that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, He dipped his hand with me in this bowl with the one who will betray me. Son of man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to, this, to that man, the son of man, is betrayed, is betrayed. It would have been good for that man not have to been born. And Judas, uh, who was betraying him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. You have said it yourself. These five verses here, Jesus predicts his betrayal. And the disciples react here, and they have, um, and the disciples' reactions here have, um, they've always surprised me. Each one of them ask, Is it I, Lord? It's not me, Lord. Was it I? I was it me? Is it me that the one that's going to betray you? Uh, Be, and uh, they're, they're, they're deeply grieved by his words, by these words that he speaks here. They're, they're deeply grieved by them. And um, the, uh, let's imagine here the thoughts that were going through their heads at this point. This man that you've been following for years. You know he is the Messiah, the Christ, the one that you've been waiting, for, waiting on for years to come. And he says uh, that one of you is here and he was going to betray him. Betray, they're going to betray Jesus. The thoughts of whose mind I want to mainly focus on. You know, the, dis, the disciples here at this moment, their thoughts, their thoughts must have been going wild. There's only one man's thoughts I want to focus on here tonight, and that is Christ's thoughts. Christ's thoughts. Christ, his thoughts... As he knew that he was going, as who the one who was going to betray him, to give him up, to be beaten, to be spat on, scourged, and ending in the cru- in ending in the crucifixion on the cross. The third thing that Jesus had done in his ministry, telling people about his heavenly Father, how he was the Messiah, how he was, how he came to save the people, not from their oppression of Rome, but from their oppression of sin. He came to seek and save the lost. This thought right here is what uh, it, it gets me. The people have been waiting for the Messiah to come. Here he is, and they do not recognize him. I'll go down this long rabbit hole to say this. His whole life, his, 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 his ministry, his mission here on earth, all started here. At the wedding of Cana, we get a good look at Jesus' mindset and how he, and how he thought. The wedding at the wedding at Cana. Most of us know a few things in the wedding at Cana. It's in uh, John chapter two. John chapter two, and uh, it was the first public miracle of Jesus. And the wedding was also the first time that all twelve disciples are gathered together around one. They gathered together around one place, and we also get a look here. At Christ's mindset in this story. Like I said, we get a look at Christ's mindset throughout his life. And uh, a few months ago, um, I was blessed to be in a uh, second quarter class, which was taught by uh, Michael Ray, subject as uh, Jesus uh, the Word. In this class, the wedding of Cana was one of the subjects that we talked about. And uh, while reading over the story, we kept this question in mind, and that was, what was something that stuck out to us this time that had never stuck out to us before? <clears throat> I 
Uh, this verse came up, came, uh, up when uh, Mary came to Jesus in John 2, verse 3. John chapter 2, verse 3. It says, when the, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. When, they, when it ran out, uh, Jesus' mother knew who to come to and said, they have no wine. And then verse 4, Jesus said to her, o woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. Jesus told her, that it was not yet his time. His hour had not yet come. Let's think about this. Not yet his time. What was Jesus thinking about here? Well, why, why would Jesus say this? He was thinking about down the road. He was thinking about the future. Jesus knew that if word got out of this miracle, that the word would spread of this miracle like wildfire, and that it would begin uh, to start a topic of him being one who can uh, perform miracles, or, and even the conversation of him being the Messiah. It would start a clock so to speak, that would end with his crucifixion. When Jesus, uh, when Jesus was a young boy, he, he knew what his will and plan and purpose was. That was to be about his father's business, his case in red for us. So, um, as we ask what Jesus' mindset was at this time, he told, the disciple, he, he, he told the disciples, one of them would betray him. This is, what it would have, this is what it would have been his whole life had been towards one point, one objective, and that was to seek, save, proclaim his Father's will, and to do his mission that was sent, that was sent to him. To, uh, that was, and to do uh, is the mission that God sent him to do, to do his Father's will. So we, we asked what Jesus' mindset was, and it was to do his Father's plan, and that is simply what he did. Jesus was always about his Father's will in his life. You look, all throughout, you look all throughout the Bible and the, the Gospels, and you see that Jesus was always about his Father's will. The mindset of Jesus was huma hum humility, submission to, to his Father's will, and perfect obedience. Jesus never uh, demanded to be recognized as the Son of God. Which brings us to our next point. Jesus' mindset in the garden. We think of the crucifixion of Jesus. Do we think of the garden and what happened here? It, uh, what are some of the things that come to mind when we think of this scene here? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane with the end coming. What's going on through his head? Just maybe a few hours earlier. He had one of his followers betray him and sold him out for 30 shekels of silver, around $340 in today's time. They gathered at the garden, Peter, James, and John, not knowing what was about to happen. Then Jesus tells them to wait here. He goes a little bit farther in front of them. He gets on his knees. He prays. Our Savior, God's only Son, prayed for what was ahead. A lot was on his mind. His whole, a lot was on his mind here. His whole ministry was about what lied ahead in the next few hours. Fair people. 
we get a look into what his mindset, uh, we get a look into what his mindset was here in Luke's gospel. Luke 22, but before we go there, a little thing, a little bit about the Garden of Gethsemane. The garden, it was privately owned. Jesus visited here very frequently. It's thought to be a short distance from the location of the Lord's Supper. And that is why Jesus uh, fre frequent here very often. And uh, Judas knew of this spot where Jesus uh, frequently went to be alone and to talk for his father. And it's thought that Jesus spent a lot of, of time here in this garden. Luke 22 Verses 40 through 46. We'll stay in the Gospel of Luke for mainly the most of this. Luke 22, 40 through 46. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you might not enter into temptation. He withdrew from them about a stone's throw, he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel of the Lord, now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him, and being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down, falling upon the ground. He rose from prayer, he came to the disciples, and found them sleeping from sorrow. And said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray, that you may not enter into temptation. Okay, so out of these six verses that we just read here, verse 44, I want to pay attention to it. I'm going to read it again here. It says, being in agony, he was praying. Uh, being in agony, he was praying very fervently. His sweat became like drops of blood falling, falling down upon the ground. Jesus here was in so much pain, agony here. We have a clear picture of Christ in such great distress. It even says that his sweat became like drops of blood. That is someone in a lot of stress. Think of these three men here saying this, Peter, James, and John, watching, watching the man who they had admired and so much, who they had admired and had followed in so much agony and pain, be uh, crying out loudly with, from his distress that he was in at this moment. Crying out aloud. Think of everything that he had went through up to this point. The Bible says that he was tempted in all ways like we were, yet without sin. He was threatened, ran out of his own hometown by saying that he was the Messiah, the Christ, the one the prophets had been waiting for, uh, for they had, that they had read about. It was him, and he said that it was, this was the time, and they did not believe him, and they read him out. He was treated worse than you and me, but through his whole life, when he was at the garden, he told these three, uh, he told these three to wait here about a stone's throw away, and he began to pray with this prayer in verse 42, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. We see the mindset of Jesus has not changed. From all of his ministry, started three and a half years earlier, and to when he was a little boy, and, and surrounded by scribes and Pharisees, his thought process had never changed. He was still stayed around one thing, his father's will in his life. That was his thought process. He wanted to do his father's will. You know, I've never took a close look 
and Jesus in the garden into these last few months as I've been going over this. All that he went through, the pain that he was in, you know, I've never really stopped to really, truly realize it. I'd like, some, I'd like to share some thoughts from the garden uh, that, uh, that, I've, that I've been thinking about over these past few months about Jesus and what all applied there. I'd like, to, I'd like for us all to go back on the night that, of Jesus here in this garden, here praying and uh, he gets up and he looks at Peter, James, and John after he's praying. Let's think of this. When he gets up from this first time and he looks at Peter, James, and John, he sees torches coming from Jerusalem. But he knows of what's, um, but he, he knows what's coming. It could have been very easily. He could have very easily slipped out in the night. His, his, these three men, they were asleep, never to be seen or heard from again. But he goes back and he prays again. A second time, he gets up and he looks. Torches, they're getting closer. They're only about a couple miles out. He could still get away in the night and not tell the three where he was going. There they were asleep and they won't know what happened. But again, he goes back and he prays again, preparing for what was about to happen. He gets up a third time. The three are still sleeping. He tells them to pray that they may not fall and that they might not fall into temptation. But the crowd was already there after and the but before he could finish, the crowd was already there. And the time had come. We think that Jesus had missed his chance here. He had other chances to get away. But we see in verses 50 and 51 that he still had an opportunity to run. Verse 50, it says, And they tried, er, and one of them struck the slave of the high priest and the ear and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, Stop, no more of this. And he touched his ear and he healed him. When the high priest's ear got cut off, Jesus could have still got away. He could have still ran away. He had an opportunity to run away, but he doesn't. He stays, he heals the high priest's ear, and he goes and he goes with them with any, without any trouble. He tells them in verse uh, and he tells them in verse 53, While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this hour and the hour of darkness are yours. He tells them in verse 53, he says, This hour is theirs, and that his time has come, and it's time for him to be led away. He said, This hour and this hour of darkness are yours. Think about this, Jesus being led away. He probably went willingly. The most innocent person in this world being led away here for trumped up charges that they were trying to pin on him. This image of Jesus here in the garden has always brought the cross to a different light to me. He's always, he, he was already physically and emotionally drained he had been up all night in pain and agony over what lied ahead, crying out to his father for his help in doing his will, his father's will. Which brings us to our third point. Third and final point here this evening. Jesus' mindset on the cross. What lied ahead for Jesus was the cross, the pain, the agony, the beating physically and emotionally. And while, and, and while he was going through all this, after he was arrested, his followers scattered. His followers went every which way. In verse, in verse 54, it tells us that Peter was following the crowd from a distance, carefully, Trying not to be seen. 
probably staying back a pretty good ways, not wanting to be seen. I want to read verse 54 through 62 here. It says in verse 54, Having arrested him, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. But Peter was following at a distance. After they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard, they had sat down together. Peter was sitting among them. And the, ser and the servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the, in the firelight and, looked <clears throat> and looking intently at him, said, This man was with him, was with him too. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, another walked, uh, saw him and said, you are, you are one of them too. But, but Peter said, man I, man, I am not. In verse 59 it says, After an hour had passed, another man began to insist, saying, Certainly this man was, all, was with him. He, was, he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, Man, I, I do not know what you are talking about. Immediately... He, he, heard, he immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord that he, that he had told him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Think of what Jesus' Think of what Jesus went through here. In the garden, before the crowd got to Jesus, he told Peter, James, and John not to fall into temptation, and he warned them about what lied ahead. And he had already warned Peter about this moment in his life in verse 33 and 34 of this chapter. We're not going to take time to read that. But verse 33 and 34 is when he told him that he was going to deny him three times of this chapter. Peter didn't listen. And uh, he ran away from the Lord and bitterly cried. We know how Jesus' trial went. It brought him first to the high priest, which was Ananias. He was sent there from Caiaphas and, there, and the Sanhedrin. And then he was also... Uh, was the Sanhedrin court was also present there. There he went from Pilate. Pilate tried to pass him off on Herod, and who wanted to talk to Jesus because of all the of the miracles that he had performed. That he had performed, he wanted to uh, see some signs and wonders that he had heard about Jesus. And um, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, Herod was also the one who beheaded his cousin John. And there. He went back to Pilate because Jesus didn't say nothing to Herod, and Herod got bored with him. From there, he went back to Pilate, who, uh, who at the end of it all said these famous words in John 19.4, uh, words that have always stuck out to me and always stuck with me throughout my whole life, and that is, I find no guilt in him. But the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sanhedrin, uh, they, uh, they, they had been trying for months to get Jesus in this position that he was at. They used trumped up charges on Jesus. That, and they pressed Pilate and they scared him into handing Jesus over, the Messiah. Once again, the man who they had been waiting for to save them he was in front of them, innocent as anyone. They sent him to be crucified. Not only that, they, uh, not only that but they said, let the blood of him be on us and our children in Matthew 27, 25. After this, Pilate gave in, gave, gave in to them and traded them after he washed his hands with his whole matter. Traded them Jesus for Barabbas, a murderer. They beat him, mocked him, scourged him, which we all know was, the scourging was a whip with a device with, with metal prongs in it that dug into the flesh and ripped out bits of flesh of his back. 
to this point, to the point where his ribs were showing. Mark, that's, uh, I want to read Mark chapter 15, verses 22 through 36. Mark chapter 15, verses uh, 22 through 36. This is a description. This is Jesus. They brought him. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which was translated place of the school. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh. He did not take it. And they crucified him, divided up his garments themselves, casting lots for they, uh, casting lots for them to decide what each man could take. The third hour, they, cruci they crucified him. The inspection of the, the inscription of the charge against him read, King of the Jews. They crucified, they crucified two robbers with him, one, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which, uh, which says he was numbered with transgressors. Those passing by hurled abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha, you are, to, you are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. We all know that he said that. He said that he was going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. But he wasn't talking about, he wasn't talking about uh, the earthly temple. He was talking about his body. That's what was going to be rebuilt in three days. He says, save yourself. And come down from the cross, picking up verse 30. Verse 31, it says, At the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were mocking him, saying, uh, and saying, he, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross, so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. In the sixth hour, darkness came and fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. Ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Elah, Elah, Lama Shabbatian, which is translated is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of them heard, some of the bystanders heard it, and they began saying, Behold, he is calling for Elisha. Someone ran out and filled a, a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him with drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. Everything that Jesus went through, the Garden of Gethsemane, and what he just went through on the cross, the Romans always made sure that the, that the crucifixions were displayed in public places to show others coming in and out of the city what would happen to them if they did something worthy of crucifixion. But Jesus wasn't done this in a, in, a, in, a sac in, a, in a secret spot. This was public execution. This was... Uh, this was public execution. <clears throat> After all he went through, the beating, the humiliation, everything that he had asked the Lord, asked for the Lord to, to uh, he asked for the Lord to forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus, he never wanted to, he never wavered. He, he never strayed off course. His whole life, his mindset wrapped around one thing. And I want to read the King James Version of what Cason uh, read, verse 49 of Luke 2. It says, He said to them, How was it that ye sought me? Wished you not know that I must be about my Father's business? Jesus, from birth to death, was... Jesus' 
mindset from birth to death was pleasing his heavenly father. Every decision he made, every move he made, every move that he made, he thought about how his father would think of it. Even before the cross in the garden, he said, not my will, but yours be done. He never thought that it would be easy. Jesus never took the easy way out. He did what his father had asked him to do. You know, sometimes that's a good thing for us. We need to do what our Heavenly Father asks us to do in our lives. As I wrap this up, here, here tonight, Uh, we know whose mindset Jesus was on his entire life, and that was his Heavenly Father. The question I want to ask you all here tonight is what is your mindset on? Is your mindset on the things of this world, or is your mindset on, on your Heavenly Father also? If there's anything on your heart or mind here tonight, come now as we stand and as we sing.